Hi, it's Dr. James Johnson, otherwise known as the Floater Doctor. My specialty is in treating and managing eye floaters. Today, I put together this overall treatment assessment algorithm uh, to help you understand uh, some of the thought processes that I'm going through in trying to determine uh, what this person is a candidate for, what are their options, uh, and how to uh, progressively kind of go through this process. Uh, and it also, it's very important for managing expectations. So I know you're suffering floaters. You wouldn't be watching this and you wouldn't have done the search and you wouldn't have gone to Reddit or wherever or however you found me. So I want to go through and explain. So the big picture is, and this is a question that some doctors miss, is uh, the patient might come to them and say, I've got blurry vision or something like that. And that's very nonspecific. You know, it could be tear film, it could be cornea, it could be cataracts, it could be vitreous and floaters, it could be retina, like macular degeneration, it could be optic nerve disorders, it could be brain, it could be any number of things. The real key is, you know, if you were to come into your doctor and say, I've got shadows and figures and strands and, and something, something, something going on with my vision, the first question, or one of the first questions that they should ask, and that I would ask is, does this, this phenomenon, let's not get caught up on calling it blurry or anything else like that. Does this phenomenon move and shift with your vision? In other words, you move your head, you move your head and this thing kind of goes this, and then it kind of goes back, kind of might tumble a little bit, might go back to a kind of stereotypical position. You move your head again and kind of goes across this. This is characteristic of something in the vitreous. So um, that's the first question in this algorithm. It's like, does it move and shift in position? If it doesn't, no, it's in the exact same spot, no matter where I look, it's in the exact same fixed position there, then it's not floaters. If you're like, well, it, it doesn't really move much, does it move? If it moves, then it's a yes. I didn't say it had to move a lot. If it moves and shifts a little bit, it's in the vitreous. There's nothing in the tear film, the cornea, the lens, the retina, the macula, the optic nerve. There's nothing that can give you this, this thing of, of, of moving, shifting, shape shifting, you know, shadows and stuff like that. So if the answer is no, it doesn't, uh, then we're to the right side of that first branch of the algorithm. It's fixed in position, then it's not floaters, then you need uh, to have it evaluated, you know, have the retina checked out, um, you know, lens, whatever, um, probably in the retina if it's fixed in, fixed in position. And then, the, and then whatever the diagnosis and evaluation, the diagnosis determines how it's managed or watched or observed or whatever. So in, as far as I'm concerned, you know, that ends there. I'm not interested in after that. Someone else has to manage that. Um, if the answer is, well, yes, it does. A little bit, a lot, it tumbles, it moves, it shifts, it moves across my, okay, then we're talking about something in the vitreous. Um, it is some sort of vitreous opacity and density. So the next question down here is, well, um, the eye examination, and this can be done locally, not necessarily by me, um, an exogenous cause or endogenous cause. Exogenous is something from outside the vitreous getting into the vitreous. It could be red blood cells, a little bit or a lot. It could be white cells from uveitis and auto, autoimmune disorders. It could be white cells as a response to an infection. Um, it could be a retinal detachment. The retina is not normally in the vitreous, so if part of the retina peels off and is is billowing there in the in the vitreous, well then that's an exogenous cause. Um, could have infection, rare tropical parasites. There's all kinds of weird things, but um, those are all rare. Um, these are I, I will I will sometimes see red blood cells. I will sometimes very rarely see the, the results of like old inflammation. Uh, and occasionally, maybe once or twice a year, I might, I might make the diagnosis of a retinal detachment and I scoot them off to a retina specialist to manage that. Um, but generally, my practice as the floater doctor, uh, these are not the typical floaters. They're important, and certainly they're important to rule out, but they're not the typical floaters that most people would think of. So that brings us to the right side of that branch, which is then endogenous sources. And these are generally the pre-existing collagen proteins that you have always had in your eye. We're born with them. You know, in, in, the, in the early fetal development in the first three or four months of, of sort of life, th that vitreous space is actually a pretty complex um, uh, place. It's called the primary vitreous and there's blood vessels and it's a support structure for the eye to sort of form around this more gel uh, blood vessels and such. And then that stuff starts to kind of regress and, and generally disappear. And then hopefully you're left with mostly pretty clear vitreous for most of your adult life. 
And um, these are, you know, not scientific terms so much, not standardized medical terms. Clumps, cloud strands, membranes, Weiss rings, basically a whole discombobulated mess of, of different sort of densities. They can be sort of two-dimensional sheets, like a sheet of plastic. They can be uh, dense, um, you know, three-dimensional clouds. Uh, it can be any number and, and any combination of them. It's not one or the other, other, other. They're not, they're not mutually exclusive. So if this is what we're talking about, an endogenous uh, redistribution of these collagen strands and proteins. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. Now, this is where it might start to look to get a little bit complicated. I've got all this on here right now on the screen, and you might say, like, oh my gosh, uh, <laughs> what's going on here? This looks complex. I'm going to simplify it. Let's get rid of two-thirds of this mess here and just say, okay, um, all right. Let's start with the young group. So, so the first, the, I generally break people down into one of three groups. And by the way, these are not hard cutoff points. I can't tell you how many times I've had somebody uh, contact me and like, I'm 34, you know, can I see you next year when I turn 35? Or I'm 44, can I, you know, will I be in that old age group once I turn 45? It doesn't work like that. These are um, overlapping groups. Go back to my first group here. Uh, we've got the um, age range here, and yes, you can have floaters younger than 20, and yes, you can have floaters older than 70. And these are just sort of generally representative of the general three main age groups that I break people down. And notice, and this is very important, that there is overlap. It, this is not a hard cutoff. It isn't like you're in the younger group, then you're in the middle group, then you're in the older group. This is uh, lots of overlap, which makes things uh, uh, very generalized, okay? So, so bear with me here. All right. So let's start with the younger age group. I say 30 to 35 and younger. Um, and you know, this curve is kind of representative of you know, in the 20s and 30s generally. Uh, now you could be, as I show here, you could be um, 45, you could be 50, and you could still have the same floaters you had when you were younger. In fact, if somebody's 50 years old and they come to me and like, I've had these things since I was 20. And I say, are they the exact same floater? Because that's kind of different. It's not, have you had floaters? It's like, are you, are you here today describing the same floaters that you had when you were 20 years old? Well, yes, I am. It's the, it is that. I'm thinking, well, that's just a younger person's floaters. You're just at that thin, 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 thin tail of that, of that curve, two or three standard deviations out. So I'll have kind of low expectations that I can do something for them with the laser. Um, on the other hand, I'm like, oh, I've had floaters since I was, I remember a teenager looking into the sky. Okay, but six weeks ago, I had this whole new, new stuff, you know, a whole bunch of stuff, flashes of light, bigger cloudy floaters. Okay, now we're talking about older people floaters. So you have crossed over to the dark side. You've gone to that older age group. Um, and that makes sense to me anyways. So um, the younger age group. Let me switch to, quick to a video here to kind of show a, a diagram of uh, what these things, um, how they're generally represented in my mind. Okay, for the first group, the blue group, uh, the 30 to 35s roughly and younger, uh, we have this problem of floaters that are very, very difficult to find. And there is a disconnect between how bothersome they are to you uh, and how difficult they are for us to see them. You'd think that they would be correlated, but they're not. Uh, one of the reasons for that is these floaters tend to be very small, um, very thin, wispy, little transparent fibers, uh, and generally very, very close to the retina, probably within about a one to one and a half millimeters of the retina, this zone in here, uh, which is a zone you can't go with the laser. Um, I have a few sayings. One of those is that floaters uh, don't have to be big to be bothersome. Uh, and the other corollary to that is that floaters are something that the patient sees, but the doctor either doesn't see or doesn't fully appreciate. And these small microscopic floaters that are in this area right here, I mean, sometimes, sometimes I can't find them, you know, and I'm looking, I'm the floater doctor and I'm looking for them. I just can't find them. So this is a real frustrating problem for the younger patients. Okay. So, um, of this group, the, the most common, and this is actually for everybody with floaters, regardless of their, of, of their age, the most common way that eye floaters are managed is to say that there's really no intervention. Um, you'll go to the doctor if you do, you get your eye examination, and the way that I was trained and the way that everybody else is trained is you are obligated to rule out 
a vision-threatening condition. Someone comes in and says, I've got new onset floaters. These things kind of came out of nowhere. I don't know what's going on. Um, you should be dilating the pupil. You should be looking all around. Look out in the periphery. Look at the retina. Make sure that there's no retinal hole, tear, detachment, any of uh, you know, volumes of um, genetic or intrinsic you know, retinal diseases, anything unusual that if you miss it, that this person might continue to lose vision uh, or lose vision um, or that you might get sued for, you know, if you miss it. You know, if you miss an early retinal detachment and, they, and it peels off later on, you know, you, miss, you, you drop the ball. So uh, that's the expectation. That's the professional expectation. That's the standard of care is you get in, you look around, you reassure the patient and say, well, the good news is it's not a retinal hole tear and detachment. You're not going to go blind. This is not part of a progressive degenerative disorder. Good for you. And the patient's like, okay, that's good, but what about the floaters? And that's when the doctor starts backpedaling a little bit and say, like, well, you know, I've got other patients I got to go to see. They get their hand on the doorknob. You know, they're ready to move out of there. And, uh, you know, off they go. So, um, so clearly, the most common ways that floaters are managed is some, some version of that reassurance. Off you go. Um, now, this month, October 2023, uh, 2023, is my 17th year exclusively focused on treating floaters. I can't believe it's been that long. Um, it has been a great practice. I've helped a lot of people, but for the first 14 of those 17 years, I didn't have much to offer the younger patients. I would do my examination, and because of where these floaters were stereotypically, predictably located, um, they were not candidates for laser treatment, and so um, couldn't really offer very much. They were disappointed, hopefully not mad at me. You know, I'm trying to make good decisions and good recommendations. I don't want to take unnecessary risks. Um, and um, I couldn't really offer them anything. And about three years ago, I introduced low-dose atropine uh, to my practice. Low-dose atropine is a, uh, a custom compounded pharmaceutical eye drop, and uh, it works by mildly dilating the pupils, not the big blown out pupils, not the big blown out pupils that uh, you get um, when you have the full strength dilating drop. So uh, here's a, a, a quick little thing I usually show my telemedicine patients is, you know, you're looking at the eye, here's a schematic. On the uh, left-hand side is a small half circle, black half circle. That would be a pupil under normal bright office settings like this. Uh, the low-dose atropine would only mildly dilate, low-dose atropine would only mildly dilate the pupil. So on average, it increases the, um, the diameter of that pupil, maybe about one and a half millimeters. This dotted line would be the size of a full size eight or nine plus millimeter pupil, big pupil, right? So that mild dilation um, should not introduce much sensitivity to light and it's much milder than the full strength dilation so it should not um, affect your ability to see up close which is what the, the dilating agents typically do, full strength ones do. So this low dose atropine uh, has been an amazing and important addition to my practice and so just as I've kind of drawn on this uh, this, these sort of treatment options here in the blue. The thickest and heaviest one which is my general kind of out of the box, out of the gate recommendation, low dose atropine. Super safe. Um, it is used in children to treat their myopia from young age, seven, eight, nine years of age through puberty for so for years, every day, they'll put these kids on low dose atropine. Uh, only about 3% of the kids have some mild allergic reaction, a little bit of you know, puffy, itchy skin, something like that. It's reversible, it goes away. I haven't seen any reports of long-term um, you know, eye health uh, risks to eye pressure or cornea or cataracts or, or, or retinal problems. Seems to be really, really, really safe. I'm really happy to be offering this. Um, and so I do that through telemedicine things. That's a really, really great option. Now, what about the laser? So I am the floater doctor, my 17 years of, of using the laser. I've got a ton of experience with it. I, I generally discourage younger patients from making the long trip to come and see me. Now, if you're in the North Texas area, you happen to be coming through, you've got family here, friends, whatever, and you want me to do the evaluation, yes, of course. I'm not gonna turn you away at the door. I'm not gonna refuse an appointment, but I'm all about managing people's expectations, safety and managing people's expectations. And uh, I just don't think that it is a, um, a, a, a cost, predictably cost um, effective process of coming all the way here for me to kind of render the same opinion as your local doctor, which is can't treat it. 
Um, okay, let's switch now to the middle group here. The middle group is the roughly 35 to 45, but of course there is overlap. Um, so really, um, I mean, really it could be 30s, it could be, it could be 50s, um, but it's the in-between group. And the treatment options and, and the uh, potential for treatment with the laser, for instance, is kind of in-between as well. Uh, let's go back to the board and let's talk about the types of floaters that you generally see with this group. Okay, the yellow group, the middle group. Uh, this is the roughly 35 to 45, a little bit younger than that, a little bit older than that because there's overlap, of course. This group is much harder to predict. Um, they can be all over the place. Uh, they generally don't have just the smaller floaters closer to the retina, but they also haven't had the more comprehensive widespread changes that you typically get with the older age group. So I would maybe characterize them as having um, more cobwebs, in strands and fibers, maybe in different layers and different la uh, levels, front to back, and you know maybe some that are closer to the retina, some that aren't. Uh, this group is also in the middle as far as candidacy for treatment with the laser, which is my specialty. Um, and it might be that I can get some of this stuff. If even if I were to clean up uh, some of this stuff here, that might make things you know overall bigger and better, uh, a clear clearer. Um, but there might still be some of these that are closer to the retina that I may not be able to get. And unfortunately, sometimes those are also more bothersome because they are closer to the retina. So uh, this, this where uh, um, there might be some success with the treatment, but I'm, I'm pretty guarded in managing the expectations for these people. Now that said, this group can also have the same floaters that the younger people have, the smaller little ones closer to the retina. And I have some, some, seen some people in their 30s that have had a posterior vitreous detachment. So it also, it also is possible that they could cross over into that older age group. So there's a wide overlap with this group. They could have uh, this, the, the younger people floaters, they could have the older people floaters, or could, they could have this sort of um, uh, cobwebs and fibers and strands. So they are, uh, they, are, they are sometimes treatable, but it's truly on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, so for this group, let's scroll down a little bit. And what have we got? We've got um, um, observe. No intervention? Well, yeah, that's true for everybody. That's always an option for everybody. Um, but they wouldn't be talking to me and you probably wouldn't be watching this video and you wouldn't be perusing the uh, Reddit sub, uh, I, I float or subreddit um, if, they're, if they were bothering you, if you found observation, no intervention as acceptable. Next step up, well, based on the generally thin strand fibers uh, that they typically have, even though they're more widespread than that younger group, uh, that group of people can respond very well with the low dose atropine. So if you're in your 30s and 40s, um, they've been kind of getting worse over time. Uh, the doctors may not have said very much and or may have reassured you that you don't have a posterior vitreous detachment. You don't have any sort of like one big main floater, but it's just sort of stuff kind of tumbling around a little bit. Um, the low dose atropine is a really good way to start off with that. Um, and by the way, like many things in medicine, you start with the easiest, cheapest, most conveniently delivered to your door uh, option that's safe for long-term use. It's symptomatic. It doesn't address, it doesn't answer the problems of like, why are you even having floaters in the first place? We can't, it can't answer that oftentimes. Um, will they get better? Will they get worse? Uh, what's going on? Was it from this medication I took? Nobody can really answer that. So um, it's purely symptomatic. It doesn't, it doesn't do anything to the floaters themselves because we're just manipulating shadows uh, with that dilation. Um, but I think it's a very, very good option uh, and a good way to start off. Now, the next step up is for the uh, laser vitreolysis here. Now this, um, some of these patients in their 30s and 40s, I, I can treat. And I would say maybe about 40 to 50% maybe of that group that I do see in person here. Uh, I've been able to do something with them for the laser. I might be able to get the ones that are in the middle part of the eye. I may not be able to get the, 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 the some of those that are closer to the retina, but even a 50, 60-ish plus percent of improvement, and that's just purely subjective, you know, patient's subjective perception um, of, of improvement is something. And uh, by sort of decreasing that floater burden, the floater mass, the floaters, uh, float, amount of floater stuff there, uh, the patient might feel like that's, that's, that's well worth trying. But generally, I'd say start with the low dose atropine first. You can always step it up and come and see me later on. And by the way, for those that pay the 125 for my telemed meeting uh, plus the drops, um, as a courtesy, I'll credit that 125 if at some point later on you come and see me here in person, just a courtesy. Um, now, what about vitrectomy? Now, I didn't talk about the surgical vitrectomy in the younger group because generally, I don't think, I, I've never seen a situation where I would recommend that. Um, it is invasive. 
You have to go into the eye with, you know, through three holes, three, three holes in the whites of the eyes. You have to go in and remove all of the vitreous. In removing the vitreous, you are removing the floaters. It is a very, very high expectation for success, but it removes the antioxidants that are native to the vitreous. It tends to promote cataracts. And so now you're talking about a second surgery that's going to remove a dynamic uh, physiological fun physiologic function of your eye, which is focusing. You put a piece of static piece of plastic in there, you've, you've lost your focusing ability. So um, uh, maybe with some rare exceptions, you can, uh, you can step that up and maybe advance up to uh, the surgical vitrectomy, but case by case basis. But generally, I think that's not something that you want to do. Uh, so anyway, okay, so that's the middle, the middle group. And then let's go to this older age group. This is my bread and butter group here. This is the greater than 45 to 50 years of age. They've often had um, you know, posterior vitreous detachments. Their floaters are bigger. They're more widespread. There's lots of clouds and sheets and membranes and Weiss rings and any combination of all this kind of stuff. Um, in fact, let's go to the board and let's, let's, let's illustrate that. All right, the red group, the over 45 to 50 and older, that also spills over to a younger age than that, but typically the older age group. Uh, this group is characterized by more widespread changes, more disorganizational, discombobulation of the vitreous. Uh, you can have membranes, sheets, clouds of various densities, large clouds, small clouds, uh, Weiss rings, uh, you can have just about anything. And some of these, you know, you'll have these membranes from the from this PVD membrane pulling off there. That can pull off a, a pre-existing Weiss ring, so you can have something dense uh, kind of pulled off as part of that membrane. Uh, you can have uh, what we call cineresis. These are clouds that might be kind of translucent-ish. They can be, um, you know, denser, more optically dense clouds. You can have cobwebs and strands. It can really be just about anything, but generally, especially with the PVD, it tends to pull everything kind of away from the retina and in this more central zone where it is more amenable to treatment with the laser, but also uh, taking it even further than that is when the, you, when, the, when the examining retina specialist in this case sees just widespread uh, you know, mess, um, it's a bit it's a bit more justifiable to jump into the surgical option, which is the surgical vitrectomy. Um, and so this is kind of my bread and butter with my practice, you know, with the laser. Um, and I can treat a lot of this, the Weiss rings, uh, the membranes are challenging, the clouds, um, but a lot of this stuff, at least it's amenable to treatment uh, in the middle part of the eye. So that's very much more characteristic of, the, of that older age group. Okay, so it could be just about anything. Um, of course, observation, no intervention, as with everybody, you know, uh, these, these endogenous floaters, just the re-aggregation and clumping of these floaters, this is not an eye health condition. It's not like an infection. It's not like uh, out of control inflammation. It's not like cancer. It's not something that has to be treated. We are truly trying to improve the quality of life and quality of vision, quality of life. So uh, very often by, time, by the time people come to me, they already have been observing without intervention for a few weeks to a decade or longer, um, and whatever it is, they just happen to be on the internet, got on Google, they found me, and, and here they are. So, um, in fact, oftentimes they're following their doctor's recommendation, maybe this was with, with you, which is give it six months. I don't know where six months comes from. I don't know where six months come from. It's just, it's, it's, it's common, it's ubiquitous, it's throughout the world. Something about six months. I don't know. We've all heard it somewhere. We just repeat it from our residency training. Uh, give it six months. So they, they, they wait their requisite amount of time. They contact me. Um, now, I, I did do a, a, drew a dotted line from this age group to the low-dose atropine. This older age group generally does not respond as well to the low-dose atropine. That mild opening up of the pupil is really good for the thin, thin wispy uh, floaters where the light kind of gets around it and it diminishes the shadows on the shadow side of, of, of those thin floaters. If you have a large membrane and large cloud, you know, open, how do I kind of do this? You know, opening up that pupil is not going to get the light around that very well. So this older age group, um, and I do have them sign up, um, that they will sign up for the, for the uh, telemedicine conference. I had someone who's in their late 50s who just signed up uh, yes, last night. We'll do that tomorrow. Um, there's no harm in trying. There's no harm in trying. And maybe if it's going to be a while before you, you know, either financially or, or, or logistically or through your job or whatever, uh, it's just now, not, now is not a good time to come and see me. Um, I totally get it. We could try with that. And like I said, I'll, I'll credit 
that amount uh, um, to, to uh, an in-person evaluation. Um, this group is my bread and butter for the laser. This is my specialty. This is what I do. Um, and uh, experience matters. Um, at the risk of sounding petty, competitive, um, scarcity-minded, um, I'm going to tell you, uh, the marketplace has changed in the last few to several years. Um, the manufacturer of my laser, um, I have a very good relationship with them. I hope to keep that. Uh, they're there to help me out when my lasers need to be rebuilt and refurbished. Uh, they've been there for me. I, pr I appreciate them for sure, but they have been marketing their lasers as our laser treats floaters. All you need is a medical license, right? All you need to be is an eye doctor, right? Uh, get our laser, use our laser to treat floaters. My response to that is the laser doesn't treat floaters. The doctor treats floaters. Um, and where I will criticize them a bit, cautiously, is um, they, I don't think that they have not been committed to teaching training, certification, skills transfer, course of instruction, uh, online teaching module, none of that. So basically, they'll sell the laser, they'll have a couple of bullet points of recommendation, use this lens, uh, maybe treat somebody after they've already had cataract surgery, a couple other basic things, some of them I don't agree with, um, and that's it. So what I'm finding is that uh, I've had a number of people that have contacted me and they're like, eh, I already had laser treatment and it didn't work. Some of those have actually come and actually taken that next step to come and see me and I knocked it out of the park. I mean, like great success, very satisfied, satisfied patient. So glad we did it. And when I kind of inquire as to their experience, what I've found is um, mostly the doctors are not uh, overly aggressive. They're, they're delivering almost homeopathically low, safe, but low treatments that I wouldn't expect them to do anything. You know, I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't expect that level of treatment to, to, to have any improvement whatsoever. Now, we all have to start out somewhere. Uh, I did, you know, I started in kind of gently and dipped my toes in the water and kind of gradually built up to uh, more appropriately aggressive treatments when it needs to be. Uh, but that's also, this is all I do, you know. Um, like I said on my website somewhere, I think, uh, Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers says you have to do 10,000 hours of practice, of focused practice to master a skill. Um, I'm probably at about 14, 15,000 procedures. I don't know how many, um, 18, 20 million shots of the laser. And it's still hard, you know, it, I'm still on, you know, on the learning curve. I mean, you know, <laughs> I've come a long ways, but, um, you know, it, it is a very, very difficult and very, very unique skill. Your doctor might be a fantastic, competent, uh, fantastic cataract surgeon, LASIK surgeon, general does everything, the retina, or the vitreal retinal specialist. I mean, vitreous is in their middle name, right? Vitreal. But, but those surgical skills, you know, and, and they are, you know, retina specialists, man, that they have some very, very special skills, you know, um, but those don't translate to treating floaters. So, um, you know, caveat emptor, buyer beware. So my bread and butter group is the 45 to 50 and older, laser vitreal lysis. Now, what about the vitrectomy? So I do not come out of the gate demonizing and vilifying the surgical vitrectomy. I believe that there's a, there, there occasionally I might look at someone's eye and say, based on the amount that's going on here, based on your home location and how many times we might be talking about doing treatments, it may not be very, very practical uh, to, to do the laser. I may just not be, or, or, you know, maybe I can treat this, but I can't treat that because that's too close to the retina. So sometimes I'll say, you know what, maybe you're a better candidate for the vitrectomy. More commonly, I might do a treatment or maybe even a second treatment. And if we're just not getting out of the gate very far, 10% better, 20% better. You know, I can't justify that. You can't, you can't keep doing 10% increments, 10% better, 10%, 10% 10 of that, 10% of that. You know, you're never going to get good enough better. So, you know, in, in those cases, oftentimes I'll just say, you know what, um, I can't push past that. You don't have to pay me. Uh, I haven't delivered value to you. Um, maybe the vitrectomy makes a lot more sense. And then I've had at least, you know, one, one patient who was maybe 80% better with the laser. You know, you might say, gosh, 80%, that's fantastic. But that last 20% was still bothering her. She went on to have a, a vitrectomy and was very happy with it. So, um, I, I kind of look at the vitrectomy as not my direct competitor. It's not laser or vitrectomy, it's laser and maybe vitrectomy if I can't deliver the goods, can't get it good enough better. If you're not a candidate for that, there is this other thing that is more invasive and, and, and that. Um, 
the vitrectomy can have fantastic outcomes. Some of these patients are super, super, super happy, but sometimes it is a process. You try this first. If this isn't working for you, you can always do the vitrectomy later on. And by the way, there's nothing that would happen with the laser that would preclude you from stepping it up to that next step, which is doing the vitrectomy. I am like laser ninja. I am in, I'm out, don't leave any scarring. There should be no evidence that I've been there other than less floaters. What am I missing here? I don't know, I've covered a lot of ground. It's been 30 minutes already. If, you're, if you've made it this far, man, bless you. Um, <laughs> there's a lot going on here. So um, I hope that this answers some questions, kind of gives you a big, broad overview to where you are. And by the way, the best predictor of somebody's candidacy for treatment with the, with the laser particularly um, is their age. So uh, people will contact me, they'll email me, and they'll be like, it looks like this, it looks like this. Do you think I'll be a candidate? And I'm like, how old are you? Oh, I'm 28 years old. Probably not, probably not. Um, I'm 55 years old and the doctor told me I have a, uh, I have a posterior vitreous detachment. Now we're talking, probably much more likely, you know? But I always, uh, I always get first rights refusal. I, 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 I will do my own evaluation. I found that the other doctor's notes are not very helpful. Even the retina specialist will just say PVD floaters. Um, there's no kind of professional expectation that they are to map them out and draw them out and go into a whole lot of detail. It, you know, in, in that case, again, it's just basically rule out retinal problems, send them on their way. Um, I hope this answers a lot of questions, maybe questions that you didn't have, but maybe you have more now. I don't know. Um, but I hope this kind of gets you uh, kind of, kind of share some of the process that I kind of go through um, to help understand what your options are. And by the way, as you notice here, I've only got four, I've only got four, uh, four options here. Observe, atropine, laser, surgical vitrectomy. All the other stuff, bromoin, pineapple, vitriol health, macu health supplements. Um, I did this, I did that. It's anecdotes, and rough correlations until proven otherwise. Um, I just haven't seen good science uh, to support these. Many of them are not that harmful, you know, probably not that risky. Actually, the pineapple and the bromelain, I had a patient who told me that they developed gastritis and had to be scoped four times and they're on medications, antacids and such, um, because they, he went all in on the nonspecific proteolytic enzyme known as bromelain. So even that, even the natural uh, things uh, can be can be problematic. Um, all right. So, anyways, if you made it this far, thank you very much. Um, I'll try to put more of these out here. I like you know. I pr I wish I could do this short form. I've just got too much to say, and uh, I find a lot of my patients who are just you know sponges for information. They really, really, really want uh, to learn more and more about this because the doctors aren't helping very much. Uh, your local doctors aren't helping very much. So, I hope this helps. Anyways, have yourself a. Uh, a great winter and I look forward to uh, seeing what goes on in the comments. Have a great day.